as Sonia said, I was trained in, in statistics, but I'm also part of, uh, we, at Carnegie Mellon, we have a very large collection of people, generally speaking, in machine learning. And we started um, t mostly through statistics in the School of Computer Science. I actually joined the School of Computer Science to help create a uh, department, a machine learning department, uh, some years ago. Um, and when we did that, we had a retreat to discuss different perspectives. And one of my computer science colleagues at, during this retreat got up and he, and he said, you know, I've, I've finally figured out the difference between statisticians and computer scientists. Statisticians want to solve problems with 10 parameters and get it right. Computer scientists want to solve problems with 10 million parameters and get an answer. So this has um, kind of, these two disciplines have kind of merged together and now what I think we're all after is, you know, really how can we get it right while also scaling up? Um, I'm going to talk about this a little, but I have to warn you, I don't have deep uh, or, or insightful things to say. It's really just kind of the uh, emerging frontier now. Um, but maybe my perspective is a little different than some others you might hear because I'm a statistician. So um, we are, are interested in, and, and by the way, at the beginning I'm going to repeat a lot of what Nico said, but with different words. Uh, so we're interested in the problem of what's often called neural coding, which is to elucidate the representation and transmission of information in the nervous system. And um, the first answer to how neurons represent and transmit information came from a series of results. Uh, here I've listed three different, it's the middle button, right? Oh, the up one. Ah, okay. Um, uh, three different sets of investigators, all of whom ended up getting Nobel Prizes for work on different systems, partly articulating this general fact that uh, neurons transmit information by modulating firing rate. And I'm just going to show you some data from Hartline in the 1930s. He recorded from uh, horseshoe crab or limulus, um, which has a large optic nerve coming from the uh, one of the eye, well, from the pair of eyes, and he recorded from a single neuron. Uh, after when shining a light on the retina. Um, and here's a bright light, you get rapid discharges. These are the spikes that Nico talked about. If you, if you let the light get dimmer, you get less rapid discharge and dimmer still even more, even less rapid. And the point is that the firing rate seems to encode the strength of the stimulus. Now, this data's, uh, th th these data were interesting, but they're a little deceptive. If, oh, and by the way, he called the place where you have to shine the light in order to get the, that particular neuron to respond, he called it the receptive field, which is a term I'll come back to in a second. Um, this, the, the, these data are deceptive because if you look at most data in cortex, this, in the, the layer of the, the part of the brain that um, most people, I think, are interested in, um, it, you, you see a, a lot of uh, variability uh, and so here's one experimental trial, and here these crosses are the spikes as they occur across time. This is uh, when a particular cue um, uh, begin, uh, emerges, and this is time in milliseconds after the cue. Then the second line is the second trial, which is as nearly identical as the experimental can make it to the first trial, and so forth. There's 15 repetitions. There's a lot of variability. This is one of the things that I wanted to impress on all of you. Um, there's a, a, a way you can summarize this that's very popular. It's a nice uh, histogram where you just average across the trials and normalize so that you get in spikes per second here. Um, and it shows the general tendency over time for the neuron to fire. But it's still, as you can see, very noisy. This is why they're interesting statistical problems. So the neural coding question, first of all, is what stimuli or, or actions will drive neurons in a particular part of the brain to, to fire rapidly, but then as time went on, and Nico was saying, you know, as we get into, say, the 1980s or so, people started asking more complicated questions. How is information represented in ways that go beyond the gross changes in firing rate? And, and, and in particular, how does the network of neural responses vary with experimental conditions? So throughout, the statistical aspect is we have to identify the signal together with um, some extraneous noise, and that's why there's statistics. So uh, here's again the Utah array, which uh, was used in the um, data I'm going to show you by uh, a former computer science student, Ryan Kelly, a uh, very talented guy who uh, did a postdoc with me for a short period before going on to Google. 
And um, here are these raw tracings uh, coming off the electrodes that uh, Nico talked about, filtered either for local field potential or spikes. These are a bunch of waveforms that repeat, and when they do, then they're considered to be spikes. And then, and then the next step is to uh, spikes from the same neuron. And then the next step is to show where they should, where they occur in time. The blue is another set of spikes of waveforms from a, a different neuron, so you get a different second spike train off that electrode. Um, and here's a nice movie that Brian put together to, uh, he, to, to show um, kind of the, the, the nature of the data that you can get. Uh, this is primary visual cortex from an anesthetized animal who's being shown a movie, and you're going to see the movie flash or in, front of, uh, in front of you here. Uh, and each circle is the receptive field for a different neuron. When, when it's red, that neuron is firing. When it's black, it's not firing. And down below, you'll see the spike trains as the movie evolves. So the point really, the reason I'm showing you this is to give you the sense that there's a, a very rich set of data that can be collected on these arrays. It's complicated, uh, large numbers of neurons, um, and it allows uh, people to ask more uh, complicated questions about the structure of the network. I also wanted to mention, um, and there's a nice uh, graph that was made by these guys, uh, Ian Stevenson, Steven, uh, Stevenson and uh, Conrad Kerting, a couple of years ago, where they looked at the number of neurons being recorded versus the date of publication. This is a log scale, and there's exponential growth. So now we have, uh, you know, a couple hundred neurons. Um, this this number is going to grow, and we can have, we can expect it to grow substantially over the coming years. So there's more and more interest in methods for analyzing this kind of data. So how does, network, uh, how does the network of neural responses vary with experimental conditions? Um, the complications here, we have dozens to hundreds of neurons. There are unknown interactions. There's multiple time scales involved, and many possible measured or often unmeasured drivers of activity. Now, um, the, the data itself, these spike trains, uh, actually, the, the data set is not very big by today's standards here around uh, 300, uh, 3 times 10 to the 8th um, uh, data values. Uh, the, the big challenge is the complexity of the relationships. So we don't yet have comprehensive analytical methods. We do have, a, uh, I think, a solid statistical framework that can produce some simple network descriptions. Um, Nico showed some. I'll show you some more. Sonia's worked on this quite a bit. Uh, Jonathan. Uh, there's a lot of people doing a variety of things. I think they're all fairly closely related. Um, and I think we are at a stage where we can articulate the problems that need to be solved in order to scale up. So in the remainder of the talk, I'll give you a quick example and just recapitulate. So this is just an example, not something we've done already, but we're um, trying to do with one of the neurophysiologists in Pittsburgh. And it's uh, similar to something, again, that Nico showed. There's um, recording in two brain areas, here the frontal eye field and V4. And uh, the, the general question is what happens in the brain when, during uh, visual attention task when the monkey has to concentrate on one particular location in space. And, the, and one of the, the appealing notions about which there's, I would say, fairly strong circumstantial evidence is that the two areas will, con will communicate through these oscillations of the type that Nico showed. Um, and the notion is that uh, one area will oscillate at the other area will tend to oscillate and that this will produce synchronous firing in one of the areas, say here, and that will in effectively increase the firing rate of uh, neurons in that area. So the statistical step that I wanted to take was to establish the um, relationship of the synchrony to the oscillation or, for that matter, other possible variables. The question being, how much of the synchronous spiking is due to the oscillation? So now let me show you the, a little bit more about the way we go about this. You can get a feeling for the nature of the computation. Spike trains occur either in theoretical contexts, meaning the math, in continuous time, shown here, um, and here the, the natural framework and probability theory for stochastic events in time is what we call point processes. But the data occur in discrete time, at the, typically at the one millisecond level as a, as a binary time series, a series of zeros and ones, one when there's a spike, zero when there isn't. Um, if we're looking at synchronous firing, then we're talking about the case where, let's say, two different neurons fire in the same time bin. Uh, this time bin in our work was five milliseconds. And here's two different pairs, 
One pair over here is a roster plot, again, like I showed you earlier. Another, uh, that's a, a pair one, is so the two different neurons. Here's a different set of two neurons. And the circles indicate the times at which both neurons fired in the same time bin. And it turns out that these two pairs were picked out to show very different behavior with regard to synchrony, though you cannot see it with the naked eye. Uh, one of the sources of this difference is, is illustrated in this picture. Um, so here's one neuron uh, on many, many repeated trials, 125 repeated trials, and you'll see these bands of activity which indicate that, and I should say, the stimulus was changing across time, um, so these bands of activity uh, indicate stimulus-related firing. So here's a place where the stimulus was driving this neuron to fire. Down here you'll see uh, maybe not as vivid, um, uh, not a vivid uh, representation, but nonetheless, there are bands of activity where this neuron tended to fire for certain stimuli. Over here is a different representation. On every line, we have a different neuron's activity. So this is the first trial for 128 neurons. This is the second trial, again, uh, as nearly as possible, exactly the same experimental conditions. Second trial for the same 128 neurons. And now you see bands of activity that seem to run across all of the neurons. But interestingly, that activity occurs at different times on different trials. So this appears to be not stimulus-related. And in fact, it presumably has to do with the, nest, the, the, the fact that an anesthetic was used. Um, so there's a well-known phenomenon of, uh, um, under anesthesia that you get these slow waves of activity going across large numbers of neurons, and that seems to be what's, what's happening. But if you're going to look for synchrony, and you want to see whether the synchrony is related to the stimulus, the problem is you're going to have a lot of neurons firing synchronously during these slow waves. So one of the things that Ryan set about doing was to dis, dis, uh, really um, untangle that, remove that effect from the uh, assessment of synchrony. So the, the models that we use are based on firing rate, as I indicated, this is the, the, the place you start. Um, and you might, uh, 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 one way to think about what firing, it is, firing rate is, is you just take some window of time, which could be broad, a big window, and you just count the number of spikes and divide by the length of time. Uh, that answer is useful for some purposes, but um, it, it has a, suffers a number of statistical defects, and what has evolved uh, really began in the 1960s and has gotten more sophisticated uh, more recently is what I would call the statistical signal processing answer. Firing rate is really represented by an instantaneous intensity of firing. It's a smooth function and this is now within a point process framework and what we say is the probability of spiking in a small window of time based on some driving variables which could just characterize the experiment is what, what's called this intensity or conditional intensity um, th this probability is the intensity times the, the length of time, delta. Uh, and this is now what we call the firing rate function. So we now model that in various oh, ways. Yes? Please try not to point at me with... Oh, sorry. <laughs> well, you know, it doesn't go off. I, d I don't know. It's not, it's not going on. Is there some way that this goes off? It stays on. I don't know why. Okay. Sorry. I'll try not to blind you. So um, here's the, the variable that would uh, determine the firing rate, and it involves the spiking history, that is, how, wh when this neuron has spiked in the past. This, this allows for non-Poisson spiking. And then there are other more interesting variables uh, involving the stimulus or this field potential that Nico talked about, or possibly the activity of other neurons. So statistical models of spike trains, are, 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 they involve two things. There's a universal formula, it's rather simple, that, sh that characterizes the noise in the spike train as a function of the intensity function, and then there's also a model for the intensity. Oops, sorry. So um, here's the formula. The formula itself doesn't matter, but what matters is we've got the probability of spiking in terms of this intensity function, and then we've got the model for the intensity, which have some effects for stimulus, history, and, COVID, and other variables. And this will now have uh, anywhere from dozens to hundreds, occasionally thousands of parameters. It, it's what we, in, in statistics, uh, generates what we call a likelihood function, and that is maximized in order to get the estimates that we need in order to fit the model. So there's an optimization problem over anywhere from dozens to hundreds or thousands of parameters. Um, then, uh, this fits in the framework of modern regression, which is just like least squares, except it's more general. 
And um, it, we have a, a variable, a response variable that's observed. This would be the spikes, the spikes in, in our case. There's some function of variables that characterize the experiment, and then there's some notion of noise that gets combined with the deterministic part of, um, uh, of the representation. So here, this, we would call this point process regression, or it sometimes comes under the GLM, Generalized Linear Model Technology. Uh, again, in our case, the noise comes from this part of the model, and the deterministic part is the way the stimulus or, or, or spiking history or, or other variables affect the firing rate function. So, model for the intensity, and then we have a data fitting method, which is typically maximum likelihood. It's an, involving optimization. So it's again, optimization over a fairly large number of parameters. And then the statistical inference. And I wanted to mention that this is often based on resampling methods. Most commonly, we use resampling methods, which means that having done this fitting, which could take some time computationally, you then have to repeat the process hundreds or thousands of times in order to do the statistical inferences, significance tests or competence intervals. And this uh, often, you know, when students do this, they will often uh, have to let their computer run overnight in order, if they're using their own laptop, it'll often run overnight. And one of the efforts that people have started to make is to speed this process up. So for synchrony, we want to look at covariate effects. What is it that drives synchrony? And I'm going to skip the uh, methods here that we used. It actually took a fair amount of mathematical and conceptual work in order to come up with a, a way of, of uh, kind of fitting synchrony into this framework. But I'm just going to go back to these two pairs of neurons. It turns out that when you analyze these two pairs, um, in both cases, you have strong, very strong evidence statistically for excess synchrony above what would be predicted by chance. Um, when we then introduce a covariate for the slow wave activity, this is where the two pairs are different. In the first uh, left pair, it turns out from this reg regression analysis, you can, you can see that the synchrony is due entirely to the slow wave activity. But in the right pair, it's not due to the slow, slow wave activity, at least not solely to the slow wave activity. So this is a case where a pair of neurons show stimulus-related synchronous activity. And then we can then get the proportion of spikes that are explained by a given covariate. So we have the firing rate or the time varying firing rate. For the first pair, we have um, half the synchronous spikes are, are, uh, are um, explained by the firing, the time varying firing rate. And when you include the network history, you get all of them, uh, at least up to statistical error. Whereas in that second pair, you never get more than about 50% explained. And the, the, the rest presumably is from uh, the stimulus. That is, the stimulus is actually driving the synchronous spikes. Um, and now what, what we're, in, we're after really is, is not so much the slow wave activity, but the beta oscillations or gamma oscillations. Beta is what, um, what uh, Nico talked about. Gamma is a little faster. And, and currently we're looking at data to try to see whether, uh, you know, how much is explained by those kinds of rhythms. Hello? Yeah, okay. So the challenges in getting it right while scaling up, I mentioned um, not, not so much about uh, the size of the data. However, um, I did want to mention that if we, if we look at the spike trains, we have small data sets. But if we look at the original recordings, which Nico showed, the actual voltage tra tracings, that's actually big data. Um, that's like 50 gigabytes, roughly, for an hour of recording. Um, and now you have the strategic question, which I think runs through all of big data. I've seen it, you can certainly see it in genomics, where there's, uh, you know, you start with the alignment files, and then actually to do most, almost all statistical analyses, you go to, for like haplotype analysis, you go to variant call format, which is a drastically reduced format of the data. Here again, Typical, you start off with the raw data and a drastically reduced format, and I think it's a strategic question, how often do we want to reduce the data, exactly when, and I think it's an interdisciplinary uh, question. I don't think it's something that should be decided upon merely for computational convenience. Tr I trust that you all agree, um, but this is where you need interdisciplinary teams. Complicated relationships involve complicated statistical models and difficult computations. The hard part is getting it right. Um, now, in our case of synchrony, there were more than 8,000 pairs of neurons. I, didn't, I just told you about two pairs. And, and, the, and the hard parts, one of the hard things in, in the statistics is to say, well, you're going to get a lot of these synchronous, uh, you're going you're to see synchronous activity purely by chance. You have to account for the 8,000 pairs. And this is what's sometimes called multiple comparisons. Uh, and uh, we had to develop a new method for dealing with that in this particular context. 
Still comparatively easy, uh, but took about a year of work, uh, at least part-time between two professors. Um, my point being that even the relatively easy problems, uh, when you're trying to get it right, can take some real effort. <clears throat> the, um, the, the harder part is that the data can be sparse relative to the model complexity. So for example, if you look at triplets rather than two neurons, you look at three. Um, here, it, it, from our data, you see very few triplets. And if you wanted to study something about the way triplets are related to, stimu to the stimulus, you would have a hard time because the data are sparse. So the, currently, there's lots of in, uh, interesting analysis being done with uh, uh, parallel spike train data. Please keep in mind uh, that, that there's, there, these data are highly noisy, and so we need statistics. I would say that in the next five years, there will be substantial progress, but it won't be through, I would guess, you know, as there, it's rare to have big breakthroughs. I think more uh, we'll be building on existing ideas in statistical machine learning, which are things like parallel optimization, online learning, and so forth. Um, and especially this will involve using models with unmeasured drivers where we can characterize some of the activity using um, variables that we introduce into the model to characterize, again, to, to try to uh, identify things that we, don't, we, we haven't already measured. So again, uh, we need to be clever with the experimentation. Uh, Nico showed an interesting um, graphic that, that talks about the iteration of analysis and experimentation. This is also something I think is very important and will involve new ways of thinking we also need to be clever with the computation and with the statistical analyses, but I think, you know, importantly, as I've tried to emphasize already, these three areas kind of have to merge and we all have to work together in order to be sufficiently clever to tackle the big data problems. Thank you. Questions? Go to. So, thanks for a very nice talk. Uh, one thing you didn't uh, talk about was this problem of, of spike sorting. And yes. Making sure. So, is that something which is less of an issue, you think, for the Utah arrays? Or, and how no. So, this, uh, is, this is, yeah. So, why, yeah. So, is yes, something so to worry about? It, it's the problem that we all like to sweep under the rug. Ryan, as it happens, in that data set, was very, very careful. He did it by hand. Um, that is, he, he went back very carefully over, uh, over all of the units. And actually, only about 50% of them were high quality, and he was confident that they were well sorted. So um, is it a big problem? Absolutely. Uh, so for those who are not aware, identifying those distinct waveforms, I showed you a picture that Ryan made where there were the blue waveforms and the red waveforms. That was the nice case. There's much more, com well, equally commonly, there are a, a very difficult problems in trying to distinguish them, and yes, uh, Jonathan has worked on this recently. Um, many people work on it. It's, it, it, is, it is a very important problem and uh, one that d definitely needs to be solved, especially for things like synchrony, as we're interested in. Yeah, please. Yes, Shri Joy. Do you think your analyses would scale up to like other data sets? Like, could you apply your analyses to Nico's data sets or you know the data sets that Jonathan's working on, or are they very specific to the to the data set that Ryan had in hand? No, no, I'm anxious to apply it to Nico's data. Absolutely. I, that is, I don't, I don't, there, there, I don't see a scale issue in what we have done so far, because we've we've tackled what I say is that relatively easy. You can work in pairs of neurons. That's not hard in terms of scale. What's harder is when you want to combine larger numbers and you have to figure out how you're going to do it because as I said the first issue is the data are sparse so you have to come up with a different paradigm in fact Jonathan's going to talk about one kind of uh, paradigm to deal with with I think with uh, with larger numbers of, of neurons but but it, it requires different ways of thinking more questions or comments what do you do you see a chance to team up sort of with computer scientists who do this mining of large set of data, which then can be transformed into neuroscientific questions. Um, are you talking about for if we if we had all the data, uh, you know, kind of? It no, I think for example, we heard this morning this talk about this text mining yes. issues and so on. I, I think it, uh, that these kind of methods could be in some some cases be transferred to our problems as well, as we, for example, did with the frequent item set mining. Do you, did you get in such kind of? Well, I'm not, I'm still, are you still, you're talking about text, like going into journal articles and so forth still? No, no, no. no. I'm you're talking about data. I'm, I'm talking about your 
scientific question problems yes bike trains and so on and i think um, people here have a lot of tools available which so, so to say needs to be transformed into our kind of problems right so yes i'm, I'm certainly very anxious to um to see what the possibilities are. And um, I, I think, to me, the, the, the important thing is to build into any of those efforts the analytical tools. Actually, I would maybe build into is not the right word. Uh, to take account of the analytical tools that people will want to apply. So if you're going to, let's say, put a lot of data sets up in a, uh, in a, rep a repository, and you want to have relevant ontologies and so forth, you, you need to take account, I think, of the analytical methods that are likely to be used. So in that sense, I think it's absolutely essential to collaborate. Um, certainly, there will be great opportunities to, for, for analysts to use those, those kinds of repositories, but only if they're useful to the analysts. Okay, thank you very much, Rob.